our next speaker is Boss, uh, CTO of LumaGuide. Uh, he's a functional programming enthusiast and has been a Haskell programmer for 15 years. Three years ago, he decided to try Nix at LumaGuide. Thank you. Well, last talk at NixCon, and this is actually my first NixCon, and uh, I really liked it uh, so far. Um, um, yeah, uh, Nix at LumaGuide. So we are a very small company. We're about 10 people. We have three full-time software engineers, uh, including myself. And uh, my colleague, actually, Falco, he's uh, sitting in the back. Uh, he, uh, he's also a Nix contributor uh, at our company. Um, basically, uh, to set the stage, I would like to begin with a small, uh, of a short video uh, about what we do at LumiGuide. It was produced by uh, the city of Utrecht, which is one of our clients. So let's see if, if the sound is working. So this is, uh, this is actually another facility of ours in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and you can see kind of what, what the, the problem that we have in the Netherlands. If this facility is like nearly full, like 80% full, then if you come here, then yeah, you need, really need some kind of guidance system that tells you where there's a free place to park your bicycle. And what you can see there, our sensors are mounted to the ceiling. They're basically cameras, and they see where the free pl pl places are. Um, so how does our system work? Um, so I have a kind of a schematic here. What you see at the top are the, uh, the facilities. Uh, in the facilities, we have the sensor system, cameras. They're connected to a facility server, so a local computer that does all the computer vision work. And then the server uploads is its measurements to a central uh, system, which is hosted at a professional data center. Uh, somewhere on the internet. Actually, it's, it's hosted at Hetzner. Uh, I think not too far from Munich here. Um, yes, and this central system uh, does a, a few things. Uh, so it provides, it serves an API that, are, that, third, that is used by third parties and also by our own smartphone apps. Um, and then you see on the right, it also serves a web-based uh, management information system that our clients use to see you know, how, how, how is my facility being used? And it, yeah, you can see all kinds of statistics and you can see like a live map of the facility. Uh, and then finally, uh, the most important thing is that the system drives the displays that, uh, that are uh, mounted in facilities and are uh, on the streets in, in uh, Utrecht. So how does Nix fit in into this picture? Well. All the computers, all the machines in, the, in this system are running NixOS. So first of all, the facilities are, are running NixOS. Our central server is running uh, NixOS. And this is not just a single server. It's like a cluster. And there are a bunch of machines that do kind of support tasks. We have our Hydra server uh, also there. And then finally, the displays themselves are also running NixOS. Uh, so these, uh, these are actually um, so the first generation uh, were Raspberry Pis. Uh, so it's an ARM uh, machine. The, the, the next generation of our jet, uh, displays is running, um, how's it called, FPGA 
SOC, so it's kind of like an ARM device with an FPGA attached to it. And then the FPGA is driving the displays, and then the ARM chip is running NixOS. Um, oh yes, and the last but not least, our uh, uh, workstations, so the, 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 our laptops that, uh, that we use for development, are also running NixOS. Actually, this is my uh, uh, workstation. It's currently, it's also a Mac, uh, so it's running uh, OS X, but I have NixOS running natively on this as well. And then I have also like a virtual box uh, running NixOS. Um, last week I switched to 1709. Yay. <laughs> It took me about a month to actually upgrade. Uh, I was like, yeah, not in, not in like, a, I wasn't like working for a month, but uh, there were a few broken packages that I had to wait before they were merged. But yeah, it was, took uh, quite some time. Um, right. Um, so, yeah, I've been using Nix now for the last three years. Um, but when I started, I like, I really had no idea how to kind of structure our repository um, and to kind of Nixify it. So um, I think what would have helped me back then was if I had some kind of uh, template that I could use. And I think Doman also mentioned it uh, in his talk, that, that, that we need to have some kind of example that you can start from. So three weeks ago, uh, Peter Simmons and I uh, organized a workshop in London at the Haskell Exchange where uh, we teach people Nix. And for that, I prepared this Nix to do example. And I think Jonas also created a Nix to do, uh, or kind of a to do MVC uh, example. So we kind of, maybe we should team up uh, to make it better. Um, but yeah, this is basically the template that I would like to have uh, three years ago. And uh, it, this is actually a ru running system. Um, it's, ju yeah, it's just an example that, that you can have something to play with. Uh, just to show that it actually works, I have it here. Yeah, so you can add uh, to-do items, and then you can, uh, you know, do this. This is actually a, uh, a Haskell front end, which is compiled to JavaScript, and it has a Haskell back end with a database that is storing these to-do items. Um, but the point of this is that, uh, yeah, that, that you have something um, real to play with, and then you can just copy this and then adapt it to your own company. Uh, yeah, if you're interested, check it out. You can uh, clone it on, on this ur URL. Um, just to go back to, uh, to our workstations, um, yeah, we are a small company, so we have kind of an extreme situation that everybody is running actually Nix OS. Um, and we go even further. Our workstation configurations are actually stored in our company repository. So everybody, all engineers have their configuration in, in the repository. And the way we do that is we uh, put this NixOS config attribute in the next path. And then when you do a NixOS, NixOS rebuild switch, uh, NixOS will take this configuration to be your system configuration. And this is a, actually a link that is uh, put inside our repository. And this actually points to uh, the actual file of an engineer which is committed in the repository. So in this case, it points to um, my, uh, my, v my VirtualBox configuration, which is running this system here. Uh, and then if you look uh, in that file, all engineers, they have like s s uh, their own customizations. But what all of them have in common is that they import this base layer. Uh, and that's this base layer, um, yeah, configures some shared settings, like it configures our own binary cache so that people don't have to set it up themselves, and a whole other, uh, a whole other bunch of things. Yeah, the Jonas and Doman both talked about pinning next packages, so I'm not going to uh, tell that much about it. Um, but yeah, it's clearly important. You want to uh, make sure all engineers run the same version of next packages. We kind of use the, uh, the kind of the old approach where we uh, uh, call the fetch from GitHub function, and um, there you just pass a revision, which is actually coming from this JSON file, which you can get using uh, Nix prefetch git. Um, yeah, and we saw the problems with that. Uh, this this actually 
depends on this Nix packages. Uh, that, that Nix packages is, is in your path, and that's of course kind of impure. But this works for us actually. Um, I do intend to switch to this new approach that Gabriel um, uh, wrote in this in his pull request. Um, and of course, when we go to Nix 112, we will can do this nice thing, and then you can just skip the whole uh, whole fetch from. Yeah, you can. It's it's much easier. One thing I, I do like to say about uh, this approach is wh what we actually do is uh, maybe you find this out yourself, but if you depend on Nix packages, you often want to um, you often maybe have some pull requests open with some fixtures fixes to some Nix OS module, and you actually want to use that at your company, um, but it's not yet merged in Nix packages. So what you could do is you can you can maintain your own branch of Nix packages and um, rebase all your pull requests on that branch and then put that here at the, in this revision and then that will work. But it's kind of cumbersome to kind of keep maintaining this branch. So what we did is we provide actually a list of patches. So if I scroll down a bit, you have these patches here. Um, we use the fetch patch function and you just pass this uh, URL um, to a git hub, uh, to a git commit and if you uh, Postfix it with dot patch. You actually get a patch file. Uh, you give it a hash, and then what we do is we uh, so we take the original Nix packages function, and then we run all the patches on it. We apply all the patches, and then you get um, your patch version of Nix packages. And I have found out. Uh, I, I think this is more maintainable than maintaining your own fork. And just to give an example. So this is actually uh, oh, let's see. Um, Oh no, I, I actually have it here. So if you look at uh, our actual file, which we had uh, before uh, last uh, last week, because now uh, our patches are empty because we switched to the new release. But this is, these are all the patches that we actually have in here. So it's quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I think this is a bit more easy to, easy to maintain than a than a fork. Okay, so uh, so at the company we have basically two people, me and, and Falco, who, who are the kind of the Nix guys. Um, but our other engineers, they don't really care about Nix. Uh, they just care that it works, but not really how it works. So uh, the very first thing I did was I kind of made uh, a make file that had all the commands that you typically need to do, like uh, entering a development shell, building a package, deploying a machine using NixOps, but then with kind of familiar names. Um, and we used this for uh, a long time. Um, but make files, they have a bit of uh, a few abstraction problems. They are quite hard to kind of abstract. So if you want to like have a target for every Haskell package, that it is possible, that, but it's a bit hard to do. Um, so at some point, we decided to go to, uh, to Haskell to, to have kind, of make, kind of have a Haskell command that you can invoke. And then, which will do all the things that you need to do. And a very f important thing that we had from the make files is completion. So when you're, when you're in your, your shell, you can type make, and then for example, machine.deploy, and it will complete that. And so you don't have to type that in all the time, and that saves a lot of time. And we, we did want to have this in our new uh, Lumi tool, this Haskell tool. And I'm just going to show quickly how this works. So. Um, so I'm in, in my repository here. So by the way, if I'm just somewhere on my file system, I can type in Lumi and it will jump to my to our repository. And then, for example, you can say, okay, we have a machine called Zeus. And you, here you can see the completion working. You can say Zeus, for example, build. And then this will invoke uh, NixOps and it will start building uh, the machine. Actually, the, the script uses... Um, uh, the Shake build system, maybe some people will know it, it's kind of like a make DSL in Haskell. It manages all your dependencies for you. I'll uh, just skip this, not really that important. Um, so how does this work? Well, Lumi is actually not the name of this, uh, this Haskell package. It's actually uh, installed as a shell alias. So when we type Lumi, uh, this actual script is executed, Lumi do script. And what the script... Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I told them already. 
so what the script will do, uh, as you can see, mm, it invokes next build to build this uh, Blimi2 Haskell package, and it will uh, install a link to the to this package in the in dot and in, inside our repository, and then we follow that link and uh, yeah, basically execute the script. But if you if you would only do this, then uh, it would take quite a long time because next build is kind of slow. Um, even if it's already cached, uh, it still has to kind of, yeah, as you can see here, we, we, um, we invoke the default.next file in our repository and that is kind of big. So evaluating this takes time and that's not nice. When you want to have auto-completion, it needs to be really quick. So we extended it with uh, a bit of kind of caching. So uh, when the Haskell source file, so this the source file, uh, if the uh, if it's if it's older than the uh, time of the link, then yeah, then th then you only need to build it. But if it's if it's younger, then you can just uh, follow the link and be sure it's up to date. And so yeah, and as as you can see, it's it's pretty uh, pretty quick. So yeah, yeah there's some other stuff. Yeah, so I, I would recommend that if you uh, you know want to introduce Next in your company, try to abstract it away so that nobody sees uh, you're actually using Next. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we have our own Hydra. <coughs> um, I can actually show it. So we have it running here. Uh, it's actually still on a public URL, but of course it, it is um, protected with a password. Uh, but um, uh, at some point I want to put it uh, in our VPN so that, you know, even uh, when the password doesn't work, uh, yeah, you can't access it. Um, so here we see uh, one job set. Uh, let, let's just go to our jobs. So you can see quite a number of uh, jobs. Mo most of them are actual Haskell packages that we use, uh, that we develop ourselves. Um, it may appear that we have lots of Haskell packages. Uh, well, we have about, I don't know, 50 or so, but we have multiple different configurations of packages. So here the devil ones are packages that we build with uh, dash O0, so we disable optimizations. And we also have production builds like here where we do put in the dash O so that we get optimized builds. One thing that I want to zoom into is uh, this thing, test stalling net. So stalling net, that's the Dutch, st stalling is a Dutch word for parking facility. Um, and um, stalling net is our NixOps network. And we, we have this uh, test suite, um, which, which is using the standard NixOS testing uh, infrastructure. And um, I was really surprised that when I, so I, I wrote this test, so I had this, uh, I can show it here. Um, yeah, here we have this, this test, so we, we say make test. You put in a bunch of nodes, so we have a central server, a facility server, which is doing the image analysis. Uh, we have a bunch of other things. We even put in a workstations like, like this machine. And then we have like a build script, uh, where it is? Uh, here, this Perl script, which uh, starts all the machines. And then it runs a few tests for Central. We, we check, okay, is Nginx running? Is our Haskell, uh, Lumi Central server, Haskell server running? And yeah, we do that for all kinds of things. Um, I was really surprised that when I ran this, I, you get this nice test report. I didn't know that existed, so I was really surprised by that. You get this really cool um, test support. Let, let's zoom in a bit, and you can this kind of you can actually click this open, and then you can see like all the tests, and you can see the output. So this is this is really cool that you can just uh, debug uh, uh, a test. Well, the, the the one thing that's not so nice if your test fails, you don't get this report. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, yeah. <laughs> that can be improved. <laughs> so we use NixOps for deployment. One thing that is uh, that we ran into. Uh, so say you uh, you want to deploy uh, a sign, some sign of display in U Utrecht. So you type in next of deploy, uh, include uh, and this my, my sign or my machine. And then uh, you deploy and then later you want to connect to this machine and then suddenly you discover you can't reach it anymore. 
you know, it's offline for some reason. And, you, and this actually happened to us in practice. We, we screwed up our VPN configuration and then the, the sign was suddenly not accessible anymore. It was still running, but we just screwed something up. Um, yeah, and the only way to fix this is to actually get out of the office, get in, into your car, drive to another city, or possibly another country, because we have also in, we have systems in Belgium, and we are installing a system in the UK. Uh, so yeah, that's that's not the way to fix this. So uh, actually, Falco he um, he made this automatic rollback system, and the way it works is we uh, every system has this. Uh, Lumi automatic rollback timer installed. And when the timer fires, it always fires after 20 minutes, we roll back the system. So we call NixOS rebuild switch rollback, and it will roll back to the previous configuration. Well, you don't, of course, always want to roll back. You only, only want to do that when, um, yeah, when you can't reach the system anymore. So what, what you do is typically you deploy a system, and then this timer starts running. And then in that window, the 20 minute window, you will uh, you, you, you execute some command to stop the rollback. And the way to stop it is to, um, we have this file here, uh, the rollback version. If you put that at the version that, you, that it needs to run at, then it won't uh, roll back. So if, if the cur current version of the system is bigger than, yeah, if it's bigger than the, the, the rollback version, it will roll back. So if you put in yeah, the right version, then it will stop. And this actually has saved us uh, a number of times uh, when we screwed something up. And then the system will just be online again after 20 minutes. That's very useful. And I think it might be nice to actually kind of package this for NixOS, um, because I think this can be generalized for, for all NixOS systems. Oh, and uh, yeah, uh, this was already it. <laughs> I guess we have plenty of time for questions. Does your Hydra, how do you build the RMD7? Yeah, um, we have our own uh, Raspberry Pi build farm, so we have uh, two Raspberry Pis uh, oh. <laughs> on the desk. <laughs> And uh, they're doing the, the builds for us. They're actually not hooked to Hydra yet. Uh, we had some problem kind of connecting the Hydra server, which is running on Hetzner, to the Raspberry Pis. That kind of wasn't really reliable. Uh, but we should, actually. Because then the nice thing is you, you, if you do it on Hydra, then all the um, build artifacts will be on Hydra. And now they're always on the, these Raspberry Pi build machines. And you have to kind of copy them over to your machine when you want to deploy a sign, and it's kind of cumbersome. So if you have it on Hydra, then it will be smoother. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, question about the pinning. So uh, it seems to be a popular topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you considered like, using Git sub modules and then just using a relative path to the sub module? Uh, you mean a sub module? Oh yes, yeah, so, uh, keeping next packages as, as a submodule in your own repo. Um, I did use submodules at some point. I'm not sure I use it for next packages, but they're always kind of tedious to handle because, yeah, you, every, all engineers really need to be aware that you have these submodules. Um, and then when you, I think when you update a submodule, you really, I'm not sure you can automate that everybody doesn't so much you'll update I don't know the, the exact command but um, <laughs> yeah that could that would work that would work yeah but I think that the next uh, 1.12 approach w would be ideal just have um, this point to a tarball and then yeah the the, the w which one Oh, right, okay. Yeah, but then the question is, how do you do this on Hydra? Well, okay, you can, you can tell Hydra to also fetch all the submodules, I guess. Right. Uh, great, great talk. Uh, 
Um, I, I just want to answer this uh, question. Um, so there's two reasons. First of all, if you get clone Nix packages, it's going to take forever because it's like 500 megabytes. So you really want to use the trouble. Right. Um, and the other thing is that uh, Git sub modules are not pure, so they get stripped out, and, and you might run into problems if you want to build that on Hydra, for example. So that, that makes it not, not that usable. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? So uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really good. Uh, I like the way you uh, take a, a pin version of Nix packages and apply <coughs> patches to it. Right. I wanted to uh, mention that uh, basically what you're doing is something that you can do with both overlays and modules. You, uh, there is a new way in NixOS modules which didn't went in the release notes. I don't know, or maybe it did, and it managed to not appear as one of the top features, which is that you can discard one of the previous modules which is provided by default. Oh and yes, replace yeah. it. I know that feature. Yeah, you can disable a module and then replace it by your own version. Yes. Yeah. One thing I, I like about actually patching Nix packages is that. Say you have a pull request open, um, and y yeah, you, you kind of fix the module. Uh, of course, you can put the fixed module in your own repository, but then you kind of have to maintain like this pull request and this in your own module. And I think with, with, with a patch, you just you point to a single one, right? You point just to your pull request, and then you yeah, you just need to uh, remove the patch once it's merged. Otherwise, you also have to remember. Oh, I have to kind of also remove my custom module, and yeah, that's why I kind of prefer the patching approach. And mm. another question I have for you is, can you show again the Nix to do a web page and refresh it? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> 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 well, let's. Uh, I will check this and then <laughs> <laughs> let's right. do the celebration later. <laughs> yeah, we're almost done. Uh